Well, greetings, everybody. I want to first uh, thank the participants, people who are here this evening to view this um, this presentation. And of course, I want to thank uh, the people at Snowasis for inviting me here today. It's uh, a special thanks to both Ashley Ali, Pete Mariner, Matt Burns, and of course, Rob Toffee. Um, and I also am very, very pleased to be part of such a talented group of uh, presenters as well. It's uh, really pretty impressive. Um, a little bit about me. My name is Bob Miller. I'm a private practice periodontist. I practice in a place called Plantation, Florida, which is just west of Fort Lauderdale. I graduated by, uh, Boston University, both the dental school as well as the perio program back in 1986. And I maintain teaching affiliations with both the University of Florida as well as Boston University. And of course, I'm very proud to be um, an ITI fellow. Um, typically, when I begin a presentation, I like to have a, I like to start off with a quote and a quote that's relevant to the topic that I'm speaking on. Uh, Warren Buffett has been quoted as saying, someone is sitting in the shade today because someone planted a tree a long time ago. And uh, albeit we're, we're talking about guided bone regeneration, truth is it hasn't been around all that long. Um, if you think about it, uh, GP, GBR, the use of barrier membrane technology to affect bone growth for the ultimate placement of dental implants has been around, started appearing in the literature late 1980s, early 1990s. Uh, guys by the name of Christopher Dahlin, um, uh, 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 Christoph Hammerly, and uh, Danny Booz were all big contributors to that and uh, and its genesis. But it has its roots in guided tissue regeneration, which is the use of barrier membranes to affect bone growth around natural teeth, which started back in the late 1970s, early 1980s. So if you really think about it, a GBR. The interesting part about GBR is that a lot of the concepts that were kind of put forth uh, by the original investigators are still actually uh, relevant today. Essentially, what we've done is we've sort of perfected the uh, techniques and we've also improved tremendously the biomaterials. So essentially, we're really sitting in the shade today because of the concepts that were kind of put forth back uh, in, in its inception. Um, the title of our presentation today is a use of BioExclude, the amnion chorion membrane, and both immediate and staged implant placement. Typically, what I like to do in my presentations is I like to kind of break it up into a couple of small parts. Initially, we're going to talk about uh, the retrospective. We're going to go back and look at where we sort of came from with dental implants, guided bone regeneration, and how important it is for predictable regeneration. And essentially, we're going to sort of have a start in a conversation. What really is required for clinical success? And then I'm going to either introduce you or reintroduce you to a bone defect classification scheme that's really relevant to um, the use of BioExclude, guided bone regeneration, and how, when, and where you can be successful using these techniques and these biomaterials, I should say. Ultimately, I'm going to sort of interject my own uh, cases, showing them for different indications, and hopefully uh, kind of showing you how I'm using BioExclude successfully in my practice on a day in, day out basis. So after you view the presentation, hopefully on Monday morning, when you go back into your office, you can see just how easy it is to use BioExclude for your regenerative cases in both immediate and delayed placement. Now, Interestingly enough, there's been several articles, but uh, the truth is, is that this, is, this article sort of stands out. It's a couple of investigators I have a, a lot of respect for, both H.P. Weber and Danny Boozer. And what they've stated is, is that they have estimated that greater than 40%, and I believe it's greater than 40% of all osseointegrated osseo implants, require some form of guided bone regeneration in, par in 
for both aesthetic purposes, as well as predictability for their dental implant rehabilitations. And if you start thinking about your own personal practices and what you're doing on a day in, day out basis, my guess is, yeah, I'm sure most of the people in the audience are putting in a fair number of dental implants. But if you think about it, if you really start thinking about it, what you do most of your day is site development. In other words, typically, if you're a referral-based practice, you're not going to get the quote-unquote slam-dunk implants, okay, that have oodles and oodles of bone. Truth be told, you're probably seeing cases that require both horizontal and vertical augmentation. So whether you're an oral surgeon or a periodontist or a restorative doc who's placing his own implants, you've got to be very successful at GBR in order to place successful implants. So I, I jokingly say I'm not just a periodontist, I'm, um, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a GBRologist because I do so much GBR in my practice. So again, in order for predictability, aesthetics, things like that, you have to be adept in order to stand out in your neighborhood. In your in your uh, in your practice of vicinity, uh, in terms of being able to perform predictable guided bone regeneration. Now, interestingly enough, if you look at the history of dental implants, this is uh, one a gentleman, Dr. Bronemark, who's many people regard as the father of implant dentistry. If you look at the original treatment protocol. In other words, uh, what was what the requirements were? It was it's really kind of interesting. Basically, what he uh, put forth in his uh, in his articles and his uh, book on tissue integrated prostheses back in 1985, the protocol was remove the hopeless teeth, debride the areas thoroughly of any uh, soft tissue remnants, allow the site to heal for up to one year, then and only then you can evaluate the site for implant placement, and if possible, you place your implants, bury them, okay? And the maxilla, you'd wait eight months for osseointegration, and the mandible would be six months for osseointegration. So if you start doing the arithmetic, you're looking at a year for healing, six to eight months for osseointegration. So essentially, you're looking from start to finish, the delivery of the prosthesis, about two years. Now, I can, I, I trained, I started placing implants in 1987, and I can remember having these discussions with patients. And patients would look at me like, what are you crazy? You know, two years, you know, we live in a society that uh, our patients want things immediately. They, they don't even want to buy green bananas. So uh, again, when an article came out, which I consider this extremely, extremely important article by Dr. Richard Lazara back in 1989. And essentially what he showed us was is that you can actually extract the tooth, place an implant immediately, and uh, allow that to osseointegrate and have the same, same success rate. Okay, so over time, the concept of immediate implant placement and simultaneous GBR was, was became like the standard of care. So anytime you have over a two millimeter gap type lesion, you'd be considering that for uh, immediate placement and simultaneous GBR. Huge, huge, um, huge, hugely important in uh, the success of dental implants and also the acceptance of dental implants. So there's no question about it. We as practitioners absolutely need predictable guided bone regeneration. And I can tell you from personal experience, this is a uh, eight or so year old case, the Hisson's type lesion, allograft, amnion chorion, bioexclude membrane, predictable regeneration of that buccal dehiscence. And here's some radiographs. Implant was placed back in 2012, 2013. And again, very, very successful, eight years and counting in terms of success. Now, this is a diagram that I frequently refer to almost on a day in, day out basis. It's found in the ITI treatment guide, volume number one, uh, guys by the name of Danny Boozer, Will Martin, and several people put this together. And what they did was they boiled down, they brought it down to its elemental form, the factors that influence clinical success. And essentially, what this is, is the patient the clinician, 
the treatment approach that you use and the biomaterials that you choose will determine whether you are clinically successful. Okay, now think about it. It's an interplay between these four factors, okay, that make each case unique, but also determine whether or not you're going to be successful. For instance, all patients aren't created equal. They have different dental risk factors. They have uh, susceptibility to periodontal disease, susceptibility to dental decay, occlusal risk factors, clenching, grinding, bruxing, things like that. Medical risk factors. Are they uncontrolled diabetic? Are they taking bisphosphonates? Anatomic risk factors. Um, I had a patient not too long ago, had a needed second molar, um, a crown lengthening procedure, had a horizontal external oblique ridge, high floor of the mouth, the tooth's embedded in the ramus of the mandible, and the patient had what we call an Oreo cookie mouth, can't open very wide. Clearly, this patient's going to have a completely different experience than somebody who can open up like a crocodile. Smoking, the jury's out, no question about it. Your success rate, the uh, yield of bone in your GBR procedures will be dramatically different in smokers as compared to non-smokers. Clinicians, we use clinicians bring different things to the table. We have different experience level, skill level, judgment, treatment approach. Okay, There's no question about it that there are certain types of therapy, certain procedures that even the most uh, the, the, the best the best clinicians in the country still have trouble delivering predictability. But the most unique or interesting factor is biomaterials, the biomaterials that we choose. And I clearly believe that there are differences in biomaterials. And, but the interesting part about this is you can't pick the patients that are come walking through the door. Sure, you can decide not to treat them, but you can't choose the patients that are walking through the door. Uh, we as clinicians, listen, we're all trying to become better clinicians. We're trying to become better surgeons. In other words, our skill level is our skill level, but why we're here, and this is why I'm here, why I attend uh, uh, these presentations, AO and things like that, is because I want to become a better clinician. And sometimes we're locked into less predictable, predictable procedures. But the biomaterials is the only thing that we have complete 100% choice in. It's the only thing that we have complete control over. No question about that. Now, I want to show you a quick case um, this is a case uh, that uh, I did not too long ago. Essentially, what we're looking at is we had a four-unit bridge in the lower left posterior quadrant sextant, and uh, both the anterior and posterior abutments had decayed out. Both teeth were clearly not restorable at this point. So the treatment plan here was to remove the two teeth, uh, place implants in uh, position of the first molar position, uh, uh, second molar position, position number 18, and also the second bicuspid position number 20, and fabricate a three-unit implant-assisted prosthesis. Uh, the, two, the two teeth were extracted, and what did we find? We found uh, uh, to position number 20, there was a significant dehiscence lesion. Position number 19, there was a, the, the ridge was sort of thin at this point. Um, the, I offered the patient immediate placement with simultaneous uh, guided bone regeneration. And what I did was I placed my two implants. And typically what I'm doing is, is I will do some cortical perforations, roughen up the uh, buccal plate. I used a freeze-dried bone uh, allograft. I used a 80, uh, 20, 70, 30 min, D min um, composition. And then I placed my bioexclude membrane on top of that. Now, to be quite honest with you, there's nothing easier in the world than placing a bioexclude membrane. Don't have to tack it down. It just forms right into the position and we close things up. I always look for tension-free primary closure. I use uh, probably two, three horizontal mattress sutures and two, three interrupted sutures to close this up. Uh, ultimately, we allowed the area to heal. This is about three, three and a half months uh, post-operatively. Uh, and you can see we have complete 100% regeneration of that buccal plate. Uh, around the implant uh, on the buccal aspect of the implant in position number 20. Um, a really, really nice success. You can see how nicely that ridge had thickened out. 
and even in position number uh, 19, this is this actually is a CBCT of position number the implant in position number 20. And again, you can see complete regeneration. And this is position um, just anterior to the implant in position number 18. So again, very, very straightforward, very, very predictable, and something that we do as clinicians on a day in, day out basis. No magic there. <clears throat> now, we as implant surgeons, periodontists, oral surgeons, restorative docs, we have several choices in our treatment approaches. The first thing we have to decide is, do we want to do an immediate placement or a stage placement? And that is a big decision. Uh, so if we look at potential uh, immediate implant placement, what are some of the indications? Well, root fracture, recurrent decay, advanced periodontal disease, trauma. I'm going to show you a really nice trauma case that we did using um, bioexclude, endodontic root failure, very, very, very common, and also residual roots. Okay, a case like this, here's a, a, a patient who had a, a lower uh, right for smaller decay out, decided to wait a little bit, had a couple of residual roots here, and the patient was looking for a dental implant to replace that um, uh, hopelessly involved for smaller. Now, one of the things that is that one of the uh, one of the things that come to mind when I'm considering placing an immediate implant or placing an implant period is the mantra that implant treatment is surgically driven, but prosthetically guided. In other words, yes, we can look at a case like this and say, yeah, we can possibly do an immediate implant. No question about it. Uh, you could take those two roots out, probably maybe get uh, the implant in between into that interradicular bone. However, in my mind, it isn't necessarily prosthetically guided. In other words, there may be some compromise to the implant placement. And when I, when most people think about prosthetically guided implant placement, a lot of the times they're thinking of anterior positioning, the buccal lingual inclination, things like that. But it's also true in the posterior sextants, replacing molars and bicuspids. So here's the clinical, this is what the area looks like clinically. The next step is to remove those two residual roots. And yes, there's no question about it that I could probably figure out a way of getting an implant in there immediately. But again, it will not be prosthetically guided. It'll be surgically driven. Okay. Now, what I opted to do was place my freeze-dried bone allograft. I used a bio-exclude membrane on top of that, closed over, allowed it to heal for uh, about three to four months. We opened up the area and we have complete 100% regeneration of that site, which enables us to place a dental implant in a very predictable, prosthetically guided position which again, I think is the overwhelming reason to do this case, this particular case, and it's a two-stage uh, to have a, a, using a staged approach, okay? Actually, I have an article that's gonna be in the uh, International Journal of Periodontics and Restorative Dentistry, which is one of the uh, journals of the Academy of Osseo Integration. It's accepted for publication. And I look forward to uh, everyone reading it. It uh, probably will be out at the end of this year, beginning of next year on delayed placement. So what are the advantages for immediate implant placement? Well, there's fewer surgeries. So what does that mean? That means we're more productive uh, in, in, in chair-side productivity. In other words, we can do more procedures in a shorter period of time. It reduces the patient's treatment time fewer surgeries. So therefore, our patient acceptance is there. In other words, anytime you offer a patient, say, listen, I can take your tooth out, put the implant in simultaneously. Who, who, who's going to say, no, 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 I'd rather have more surgeries. It just doesn't happen. So one of the other things that an advantage, which a few people talk about, is you can use the extraction socket as a guide for alignment to place the implant in somewhat of a more favorable position more easily. Okay, very rarely talked about, but that's actually very, very true. 
Now I'm going to show you a case here. This is a uh, gentleman. He's about 28 years old, 26 years old. He's congenitally missing his lateral incisor and was hoping to replace this with a dental implant. Uh, you can take a look at the uh, this view. You can see we had uh, some some bone there, um, no question about it. But uh, you can clearly see that there's somewhat of a concavity there. And if you take a look real real closely at it, this concavity, if you take this particular cross section, is extremely extremely thin. So uh, we knew from um, from reviewing our CBCT that we we're going to def definitely need some form of regeneration to make this, uh, number one, a more predictable site for implant placement and also hopefully improve the aesthetics. So in this case, uh, we open up the area. You can see that concavity that I alluded to. Looking at the buckle, you can see a better view of that. Uh, this the, this uh, this situation that we knew we were going to have to graft uh, when uh, prior to our uh, surgical intervention, and one of the things I like to talk about too is a three dimensional implant placement. We're going to go into this in a little more detail, but I I, I like to tell the, my residents and whatnot that the truth is is that it's not just the buccal li lingual inclination that's important and mesial distal but it's also apical occlusal positioning. So in this case, we had to remove some bone with a round, uh, with a round diamond. Why? Because we need uh, the running room for both the, the, the restorative abutment as well as the restoration. In other words, you need that room. Uh, so typically we like to place our implants approximately three millimeters apical to the adjacent CEJs. Uh, so when I, when I actually fabricate the osteotomy for my dental implant, okay, you can see here when the, in, this, uh, in this slide that we're gonna have a dehiscence lesion. So what I did was I did my cortical perforations prior to placing my dental implant. Here's that dehiscence lesion that, you, uh, that, that we were definitely expecting. And in this case, what I used was a, a xenograft, the cerebone xenograft to um, augment that uh, the buccal aspect of position number 10, ultimately placed my bio-exclude membrane on top of that, and then uh, when I'm using xenograft, I'm typically using my bioexclude membrane with either a porcine pericardium or a collagen membrane on top of that because, because of the um, resorption pattern of xenograft. Typically, that takes months and months and months to resorb. Some people even believe that it's actually never completely resorbed. So uh, if you don't use the porcine pericardium or a collagen membrane, you might see particles of the xenograft kind of coming through. So this is placed on top of the, of the site. And uh, sometimes, uh, most of the time, I'll tack it down with the um, uh, the uh, uh, cover screw or healing abutment closed up with a couple of sutures. This is a one week post op, and this is the final restoration. Here's where we started with uh, looking at the CBCT, and this is uh, at, at about a four or five months. You can regeneration, a nice root eminence, and uh, a, a very happy patient at this point. Now, here's what I'm going to do. I would like to reintroduce or introduce you to a bone defect classification scheme that I think is extremely important. I found it the first time I found it was in the Lang and Lindy, Lang and Lindy textbook, but it was put forth by Dr. Benich and Hammerley back in 2014, first published in Periodontology 2000. And what they did was they broke up the defects into a type zero, one, two, three, four, and five. Type zero, one, and two are typically cases, well, zero is when you have a little bit too much bone, type one, small gap type lesions, um, and type two is a little bit larger dehiscence type lesions. And these, most people will say that, yeah, we can place this immediately as long as it's uh, in a prosthetically guided or restoratively driven uh, position. Uh, you can place this immediately with a little bit of um, a particulate graft barrier membrane, and you should be pretty good, type one, 0, 1, and 2. I'll show you a type 0 again. This is where we had to actually remove a significant amount of bone, so we can place our implants three millimeters apical to the adjacent CEJs. 
And I, like I said, I, I call this a, a three-dimensional implant placement. And you can expect a uh, pretty, pretty good restorative result uh, in these situations. Okay, that's at the class zero. Class one are defects. Well, these are extraction sites. Um, this is uh, position number eight, tooth number eight, had a little bit of, uh, of external root resorption, had some trauma a little while back. Um, the uh, tooth was extracted. We uh, removed the periapical pathology. And when I actually uh, palpated the buccal plate, I saw that we had a dehiscence type lesion. I first determined, can I place this implant in a restoratively driven position? The answer is yes, it can be prosthetically guided. And um, I was able to reflect the small buccal flap, revealing that dehiscence type lesion, gap type lesion, grafted it with the freeze-dried bone allograft, placed a little bio-exclude on top of the area, and allowed the area to heal, sutured and allowed it to heal for about three to four months. Uh, you can see some really, really nice soft tissue response here, a little bit of a, a root eminence. And this here is your final restoration. Okay, we're able to match that fairly well. And you can see the, uh, the patient's aesthetic expectations are clearly there. Why? Because he has such a high smile line. When he, when he smiles, you can see... Uh, you can see for miles, so to speak. And so he was a pretty happy, uh, 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 very happy patient at this point. Here are the radiographs. You can see that uh, in the first radiograph, the March 9th radiograph, you can see the uh, external root resorption, uh, the, uh, the direction indicator, implant placement, and final restoration. Now, type two defects, you can see that we have a little bit larger dehiscence type lesion. And again, this, if the implant can be placed um, in, in a prosthetically guided or restoratively driven position, um, you can very much feel comfortable doing this in a single stage approach. Okay. Cuspids are sometimes kind of tricky, but this particular case, we were able to, um, to, to negotiate this. Again, I like to use an allograft in these uh, situations. The bioexclude membrane works perfectly, perfectly in these environments. Um, very easy to use and extremely predictable as evidenced by this uh, complete, complete regeneration of that buccal plate. Actually, we had to actually profile the bone in order to place our, our uh, restorative abutment at this point. Here's our before, here's our after, and here's some radiograph. This is a uh, three-year, four-year post-op. Um, the, it's actually a, the patient had implants, for old Freelid implants placed uh, a while back that we're still standing the test of time as well. Anyway, again, a very predictable uh, uh, defect um, using uh, a guided bone regeneration in a single stage approach. Now, type three, four, and five type defects. Now, traditionally, most people would be doing those in a delayed uh, situation, in a delayed approach. Now, the truth is, is that, again, these become more and more difficult, more and more difficult to predictably, predictably do this if, in particular, if it's not restoratively driven, prosthetically guided in these types of defects. So these, more often than not, I'm doing in a staged approach. But I just want to show you a couple of defects, a couple of cases where I was able to negotiate it with, um, with, uh, with uh, a single stage approach. Here's a situation that we did a while back. Um, we have a, uh, uh, an upper left cuspid, uh, had some horrible, horrible external root resorption, suppuration coming from the area. We reflected a flap, and you can see the, uh, the etiology of the defect quite clearly here. And once the tooth was extracted, we had a very, very significant buccal dehiscence. Um, I was, again, able to place this in a restoratively driven uh, position. We got good uh, apical stability many, many times because of the angulation of the premaxilla. Uh, and in order to place this um, with the prosthetic uh, screw hole coming out the 
uh, cingulum area, sometimes it becomes increasingly more difficult to achieve this. In this situation, I was able to uh, place the implant immediately, got good, good, good initial stability. Uh, we grafted the defect again with an allograft and placed our bioexclude membrane on top of the area. Um, we allowed this to heal, closed over, allowed this to heal. You can see the before, the flap reflection. This is again about a four month post-op and complete, complete 100% regeneration of that uh, buccal plate. Um, type four lesions, again, these are very, very significant to Histon's type lesions. And again, our guy are, are determined or typically are cases in which we're doing is a, uh, an, a delayed approach. But again, sometimes there are situations where we can place the implant immediately. This is one of them. And again, we had complete, complete uh, uh, exposure of that buccal plate. I use the bioexclude membrane on top of allograft. And again, I'm using uh, I, I either an 80, 20 or a 70, 30 mineralized to demineralized uh, ratio, closed over, allowed it to heal. And again, you can see complete 100% regeneration of that buccal plate. That's a class four lesion. Okay, now type the, the the class five lesion. I'm I'm actually anxious to show you this uh, this case. This is a uh, a woman who uh, she was referred to my office as an emergency. Um, she's about 74, 75 years old at the time, and uh, good medical history. Active woman. Um, uh, you know, just uh, 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 actually an extremely, extremely nice woman. And what had happened was the night before she had tripped on her in her bathroom and she went face first into her sink area and smashed her front, front uh, upper front teeth. Tooth number eight and nine were had probably a class three mobility, extremely painful actually kind of almost numb in the area at that point. So tooth number eight and nine were, uh, uh, we were sure she was going to lose those teeth. And uh, we exposed some periapicals at the time. And you can see uh, the displacement of these teeth and uh, the need uh, for extraction. Uh, we uh, decided at this point that we were going to make our, our final decisions once we had opened up the area. Uh, tooth number eight and nine came right out, uh, both the, the teeth as well as the bone. And then we took a good long look at uh, tooth number seven, and you can see that the buckle plate was uh, broken at this point as well. So it was decided at the time that we would remove tooth number seven. And the treatment plan would be to hopefully place implants in position number seven and nine and fabricate a uh, fixed implant bridge. Um, I categorize uh, position number seven as either a class four, class five type of defect. Um, uh, position number uh, nine, clear class five defect. And I knew I was going to have to regenerate and uh, both uh, a, a substantial, substantial part of this, uh, of this defect. So uh, what I opted to do was place an allograft ring in position number nine, a bone ring. This is a custom milled uh, block of um, cancellous bone. It's uh, six to seven, six or seven millimeters in diameter. And then the, uh, the donut hole in between is custom milled to, to receive either a 3.3 millimeter diameter implant or a, a 4.1 millimeter diameter implant. And we create the bone ring osteotomy with uh, six or seven millimeter diameter trefines or something called a planator, which actually flattens the floor of the osteotomy. So what you can do is when you place your allograft ring, you can, you're getting number one, you're getting initial stability from the bone ring osteotomy. In other words, if you're using a seven millimeter diameter bone ring, 
you have a seven millimeter diameter osteotomy. So that fits nice and snugly in there. And then you're also receiving additional initial stability from the apical threads of your dental implant. Okay, so again, we're able to re restore or regenerate both the buccal aspect as well as, in this case, the distal aspect of the uh, mesial aspect of the central incisor. Now, in position number seven, I opted to place the implant immediately. And again, we have a, a substantial amount of threads exposed here. And, uh, the, you know, and I consider this either a class four, class five type defect. And so we opted to treat number seven using the bio exclude number nine. We were going to use the bone ring treatment protocol. And uh, so in position number seven, we used our freeze dried bone allograft and our bio exclude membrane on top of that. Position number nine, the treatment protocol calls for um, a xenograft with a collagen membrane on top of that, which is either, typically I, 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 um, I uh, use the uh, healing cap or the fixation screws to retain the collagen membranes. Closed over, allowed this to heal. You can see in January, this is what, January 2019 is when the uh, procedure was actually performed. She had left for, um, Philadelphia. She has, uh, uh, lives in both Philadelphia and South Florida. So she wound up having it restored up in Philadelphia. Uh, I, she left for the Pennsylvania in March and then had it restored over the summer. Uh, ultimately, I saw her in December to actually, um, uh, to, to actually um, uh, see the case uh, is in, in its final stages at, after being restored. And this is the final prosthesis, a fair result. But, uh, you know, you can see from our, uh, our CBCTs, we were able to restore both buckle plates in its entirety. Uh, position number seven, which we use the bio-exclude uh, barrier membrane and graft. And in position number nine, we, where we used our allograft ring, uh, xenograft and collagen membrane on top of that. And both both position number seven and position number nine have, uh, have very, very good prognoses at this point and a very, very happy patient. Now, one of the things that I like to show is things that are what I consider more or less outside of the box. Okay, a little bit outside of the box. And I've been, I've been, uh, as you can see, I've been a uh, fan of the amnion chorion membrane for eight years now, nine years now. And so every now and then I start seeing new applications for the bio-exclude barrier membrane, uh, you know, using it for sinuses. Uh, I used to just use it for, I think, it's just simply using it for uh, small tears, small perforations. But I, I, I saw such tremendous results with it. I use it on every single 100% uh, of the cases now of my sinus grafts. But this I thought was a, sort of a unique uh, way of using the bioexclude membrane. And this is a Wilkodontics uh, case. This is a surgically assisted or surgically facilitated orthodontics. And uh, we're using, uh, I work very closely with a couple of orthodontists and we're using it a lot in many, many cases in situations where we have to do some sort of ridge expansion okay, um, where we need to increase the buccal plate, the, 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 uh, um, the, the, the horizontal grafting use it to increase the, the thickness of the buccal plate, um, not just to facilitate a more rapid tooth movement, which is also obviously another reason why you might consider uh, wilcodontics as well. So this case here, this is a woman who uh, presented to the orthodontist, and you can see that she had tooth number 21, was actually outside of the arch. Uh, at this point, had very little, if any, bone, clearly not a salvageable situation. And what the orthodontist was hoping to achieve was basically removing tooth number 21 using Invisalign to realign these teeth <clears throat> and also increase the um, the, the, the dimensions of the ridge, okay? So uh, 
looking at the CBCT of this case, you can see just how thin that buckle plate was. So any type of ridge expansion, they were worried about uh, significant, significant uh, dehiscence type lesions. So again, it was not just to facilitate a more rapid tooth movement, but hopefully to increase the, the buckle plate, the thickness of the buckle plate. Now, I, I still um, perform the, the Wilkodonics procedure as described by the Wilco brothers, which is a full thick uh, flap uh, displacement. And I use uh, my handpiece for using a quarter round burr for cortical perforations. Okay. And then uh, according to the protocol, essentially you lay your xenograft on top of it. And the original uh, Wilco protocol was not using any barrier membrane at all. But um, in my mind, I, I thought to myself that this is actually a good opportunity, a really good opportunity to use the bio-exclude barrier membranes. Why? Well, we're using the cortical perforations to hopefully get the pluripotential cells from within the cancellous bone. That's the, uh, not just to create the artificial osteopenia, which enables a more rapid tooth movement, but also to get those pluripotential cells. So you have that nourishment uh, uh, to hopefully augment that buccal plate. So in my mind, looking at the growth factors associated with the bio-exclude, why not have it coming from both angles, so to speak, both the buccally and internally from the, uh, from the patient's own native bone. So in this case, I uh, placed a piece of um, bio-exclude on top of it. I think mean, uh, because of the size of the uh, surgery, I needed a second piece of bio-exclude. And you can see just how nicely, nicely, nicely that just lays right into position. And again, there's no suturing it down. There's no tacking it down. It just adheres to exactly what we're looking to uh, have it adhere to. Again, we look for attention-free primary closure, allow this to, to heal over time. Um, basically, the orthodontist initiates, gives the patient their first uh, Invisalign trays literally at the time of the surgery. Okay, so the teeth are moving right out of the box. And if you look at the Wilco research, it's usually you have that um, the ability to, for rapid tooth movement for up, up to six months. And uh, so again, the, the clock is running, so to speak, at the time of the surgery. So we uh, allow this, uh, I allow the orthodontist to go ahead, do his thing, place, he places the Invisalign trays, and this literally is a six-month post-op. We were able to get a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful uh, 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 finish with the case. There's still some, a little bit of my, tweaking, as my uh, orthodontist colleagues call it, of the, uh, of the teeth. And uh, you can see that we were able to achieve a really, really nice um, uh, addition to our buckle plate. This is, again, just simply a six-month post-op. And this is the uh, pre-op, post-op, and before and after photographs. So again, and what I consider a, a unique uh, use for the bio-exclude. And, uh, but uh, you can see, actually, you can even see here the little, every now and then you see a little particle of the xenograft kind of peeking through. And again, this is a function of its lower turnover rate as compared to the, the allograft. But again, an extremely, extremely happy patient and a very, very straightforward pr procedure for us as, uh, as surgeons. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention. And again, I want to thank the people at Snowasis for having me here today. And again, I look forward to your questions.